Uh, welcome to the next installment of Design Lab. Um, this is a virtual workshop series uh, that's to providing Gladstone community with an ongoing training uh, for a wide range of design and scientific illustration needs um, across a wide range of projects. I am your host today, along with um, my co-host here. My name is Giovanni Mackey. I am the uh, creative director of communications. Hey, Tammy. Oh. Uh, I'm Tammy. I'm the science illustrator at Gladstone. Um, so just uh, some quick uh, housekeeping is that we do have this in the um, in a uh, informal meeting um, and we have the comments open as well as the q and I would say drop any questions you have into the Q&A so that's easy to access for the both of us. Um, and uh, uh, you can also come off mic and um, pop in with a question if you have one. Uh, so feel free to do that. Um, and also, uh, don't forget to engage with us after the show and in between. Um, we did set up a Slack channel for all us uh, Gladstonians to um, continue the conversation when we're offline. These will be happening on a monthly basis. Um, so if you've got a question you want us to cover, uh, then um, that's the place to, to ask it. Cool. So uh, last week, I think we went over a bunch of uh, concepts at the beginning of the show, but I figured well, let's just dive right in so that way we have plenty of time to um, go over our demo and cover everything we want to cover. So Tammy, why don't you um, lead us off? Cool. Happy to. Uh, let's, is this working? You should, yeah, you I see you. Okay. Yeah, you're all good. Oh, it's weird. I don't see that outline anymore. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So if you joined uh, last month, I went ahead and um, did a demo about how to sort of optimize uh, data visualization using Adobe Illustrator. So this um, may look familiar. So what we're going to do today is talk about this um, panel in the context of a larger figure that has multiple panels and bringing them all together into a nice um, cohesive figure. So this is the part of the cooking show where I take the ingredients that are already chopped and I'm going to put them um, into our larger figure and we'll start from here. Um, one thing I will, while I pasted this in here, I can just zoom in and you can kind of just see, get a little sense of the before and after from what we did last time. So this is the um, data visualization that we started with. And then these are the, um, the more refined, um, more professional looking um, depictions. And so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of these two. We have our new ones over here. Um, I'll just move those to the side for a second. So if this is the um, the export I got for my figure, the first thing I'm going to do is adjust the size of the artboard, which is this white part here in Illustrator. So I go up to Document Setup, Edit Artboards. Um, if you know the, a journal that you're um, targeting, you'll get specs from them. They're sometimes in millimeters, sometimes in pixels. If you don't know, or if you're just creating some figures, and you're not sure what you're going to do with them later, then we recommend you use a letter sized artboard. So I'm going to just go ahead in here and make that eight and a half by 11. And then I'll move these guys a little bit closer. Okay, so now this is the final size for my figure. I know that I've got three panels and now I'm going to get to work on sort of optimizing the layout of all of these uh, three elements here. So um, in looking at this microscopy, if I zoom in here a little bit, um, the first thing I'm gonna do is get rid of these boxes because I feel like those are extra lines we don't need. Um, they're extra ink, if you will, or extra structure that's not necessary. And already I feel sort of better about my figure at this point. And I'm noticing that I've got some, it's nicely arranged already in some columns and rows. I've got some column headers that are centered. And then I have, um, what I believe are the gene labels that are left justified. So you could go either way. I just would say you would want to be consistent. So I think what I'm going to try is center justified. I'm going to use the alignment tools in Illustrator to help me align all of these together. Um, one thing I know is this came in grouped. So I'm going to ungroup this so that um, I can then make smaller groups and that will help me move things around and manipulate them. So this one panel is a little bit different than the others because it's got a little scale. So I'm gonna go ahead and shift select all three of these and do command G to group them. And then I'm just gonna take my, um, 
guess either one of these selection tools and select all of this and then just use the alignment tool to center align those. That alignment tools are also over here. So I'm just going to go through real quickly and just kind of center align all of these elements here. And then already I've made an improvement in my consistency. I think what I want to do is I think I'm going to group each of these panels of microscopy with their label now that they're all centered. So again, I'm just shift selecting doing command G. I could also kind of select that way, which is usually the quick and dirty way that I do it. Okay, so now I have microscopy with its label. They're never going to get separated. Now I want to think about my fonts here. So if I select this font, I go over here, it's Myriad Pro. Nobody wants this. Like you want Arial or Helvetica. So I'm going to go up to select same font family. And then I'm going to go over here and um, we tend to favor Helvetica at Gladstone. I want that other one though. Um, okay, so now I've got all of my fonts are Helvetica. And then I begin to think about a font hierarchy. And so I know that in Science Figures, our panel labels, the A, B, and C, are the largest. So I'm going to make those bold. Let's make those 18. And then some journals, they're uppercase, some are lowercase. They all have different specs. I don't think any of them have this little period. So I'm going to just get rid of that. And then I'm going to think about what's next in my hierarchy. I'm going to nominate these headers to be maybe the next largest, so 14. And then these here are 12. All right, that could work. I'm going to make them 10, though, and bold. Um, I think it's a good practice if you're putting text on top of pixel based imagery like photography. Um, bolding is never a bad idea just to make sure that that really is readable and stands out. Yeah, they call it reversed out text. And it's yeah. always, yeah, it's always a little bit easier to see when it's a little bit larger. Um, than you would normally do if it was not reversed out. Yeah, so I would always recommend that on top of pixel-based artwork. Okay, so I've got a lot of good alignment here. Let's remember what my groupings were. Um, I can, there's this white space in between them, which I could tighten up if I wanted. So I might just, you know, do some nudging to get these a little bit closer. And I definitely want it equal horizontal and vertical. And I can double check this um, a little bit later. But now I have a decision to make. I've got B and C. And, you know, do I want to do like a side by side kind of thing like this and then have my little legend down here? That's one option. Um, I might want to try sort of a vertical stack. I'll just get those little guys out of my way. Um, I might want to try that. So, you know, you I wouldn't be afraid to sort of play around with elements, especially if you've grouped them in a way that helps you to move them around. You can always keep aligning them as you're working, but it's um, it sometimes can be really valuable to spend a little time exploring kind of how you're going to set these up um, before you get too into it. So I'm going to try this way. Uh, so I just kind of manually move these over. They actually look pretty well aligned, but if I just select all these and I go up here, <clears throat> excuse me, I can, um, I can left align all of those. Oops. And then I got a, nope, that one. So for me, setting up a figure that has multiple panels, it's, it's a lot about alignment. Um, and so I use these tools a lot. I use them sometimes over and over. Once you start playing around, um, they're kind of your best friend when you're putting a lot of elements into one single layout. Okay, so if I try that, then I'm going to bring this over here. I don't need that B anymore, and I'll bring C over here. And then I'll just put that right there for now. And then I've got my little legend. And then I could very easily kind of select these two. This entire thing has already been grouped and left align those. But what I really want is their Y axes to be lined up. Um, and this one has more digits than this. So what I would do is view rulers. If your rulers aren't showing, you have to do rulers before you bring out guides. So 
I would show my rulers and I would drag out a guide here. And I'm choosing to favor this um, data visualization to choose where to locate it because it's the closest one to this microscopy. So I'm gonna, I have my guide there and then I'm gonna move this over so that it's sitting on the same line. And then I can do command semicolon to hide those guides. Uh, and then this feels good to me, like my Y axis is aligned. And then once you get into this design mode of alignment, you're, you're, or at least I am always looking for things I can align with each other. And so now that I've got these lined up, if I do shift um, and then drag, it'll constrain it to um, the vertical axis because I don't want it to move left or right. But I kind of feel like I could line up these column headers with this figure title. So I'm going to try that. Whoops, I hid my guide. So I do command semicolon to show them again. And I'm looking for these opportunities to kind of just get everything lined up wherever possible. So I might make another guide here. And then I will pull this one up. Let's hide our guides. All right, so let's just review the font hierarchy really quickly. So we had 18 points, 14 points, 14 points here, 10 points. I think these are 10. So that's a pretty good amount of levels of, of fonts. I think these are 10 too. And those are also bold. Okay. <clears throat> so now I've got three panels, A, B, C. I've lined things up. Um, as much as I can. There's a couple other things I could do before we're done. And one thing I notice is that I've lined up these X axes, but these little tick marks are different. It's probably fine, but we can make that a little bit better. So I would um, go ahead and select all of this text. But while I'm here, I wanna make sure they all have the same paragraph settings here. And they didn't. So. That would probably mess me up later. So I make sure they all have the same. It really doesn't matter. Well, I don't know if it matters which one, but I want to align them all um, on the right. But if they have different paragraph settings, that might not be exact. So as, I think as long as they're the same up here, we can align them and they'll work out. Um, but I want them out of my way for a second. And I'm going to select the leftmost point using the direct select tool on all of these tick marks. I don't want both points in that line. I just want the leftmost one and I want to line them all up. So I'm gonna zoom out so you can see what happens. I'm gonna do Command H to hide so you can, um, you're not distracted by that blue stuff. If I hit this, those got larger. They all sort of moved over. So now all, if there was a line here, these would be all in alignment and I like that. So I already lined up this. I'll just move those back over. Nudge you know, Tammy, I, yeah. I had a thought that um, yeah. that if you're uh, lining up the, the text there, the mm -hmm. only instance where I think you might get in a situation is if you um, end up adding maybe uh, interstitial increments on something like that, or if you move. <laughs> so I, I think actually if, if you align everything, like especially on the y-axis there, if you uh, right align it, um, then if you say change the length of the, oh, um, these guys here. Yeah. And then if you change the length of those, say, you know, do you do an increment that's say 50 and not a, not a whole, um, uh, you know, something that's got a tens or a hundreds place on it, then, then that's adding to the left rather than oh, yeah. you know what I mean. Yeah, so that way point. your alignment to the right is always going to stay true. Yeah. That's a great point. Thanks for catching that. Yeah. Super great point. I didn't even realize before that they had different paragraph settings. Um, but that would have been a mystery that in the heat of it, you know, might have been frustrating if you hadn't realized, you know. It's just one less thing to think about. If you just end up adding things to it, then you can just sort of know that that, you know, that sort of um, that alignment is going to stick. Yeah, for sure. OK. Um, couple more things. We're not quite done yet. I think that I want to make sure these two are vertically aligned. And then, Devani, I'm asking you a question. These are usually like above your panels, right? 
uh, which the oh, panel the, labels. The panel label. Yeah, I mean, this is kind of like a funny. Um, I don't I think like there's a hard and fast rule. Yeah, I I kind of so yeah. So this is a really good. Uh, I like to hear other people's opinions on this actually. But the way that I approach it normally is that if you were to put imaginary bounding box around the content of that panel, um, that it would sit sort of in the corner in the upper left-hand corner, right at the intersection of that bounding box. So, I mean, I guess I, I could sort of annotate that. But, yeah, um, let's do it. Uh, here's my little annotation tool. We were just playing around with that. Oh, here we go. Um, so yeah, so if, uh, are we going to make a little box? Uh, and I guess it would kind of sit right about there-ish, you know? And, um, so then I would kind of, you know, have that panel label just kind of overlap or sitting like in the corner there. Now that's just optical too. So it's not necessarily mm -hmm. a hard and fast rule, but I would also, um, the sort of, uh, overarching rule though, would be that if, if all your content is fitting in nice, neat, you know, um, sort of rows and columns that, um, that those labels are sitting consistent across all of those. So, you know, as you had these two top ones sort of agree now they're, they're horizontal space and where they're sitting on that, um, that looks, you know, your B for example, is sitting optically aligned to the, to the B panel for me right there. But yeah, I think it's, um, I don't know. I don't have a hard and fast rule for that, but that's the way mm -hmm. that I sort of approach it. Okay. Well, very good. The one, the reason I ask it, well, I'm going to align these two, mm -hmm. um, but then this one's a little bit tricky because I don't want it to sort of line up with this, right? Like I want it to be a little bit higher. Yeah, exactly. So in an ideal world, you know, we would sort of, we wouldn't have this little extra space down here. Um, let's hold off on that for just one second. I want to show one more thing about color. Um, something that I like to do when I'm working, especially data visualization or things with um, like text on boxes, like a schematic or something, is to check how this would look for someone with color blindness. And I know that um, journals are really uh, sensitive to this and really forward thinking in this respect. So if I go up to view um, proof setup and I pick this top color blindness, now you'll see everything has changed. It's just a preview. But um, if I zoom into here, I can see in my data visualization that I might not like these colors, although I do kind of like this color. Um, I might not like these colors, but I can see four distinct colors. I can see four grays. These two look a little similar to me. Um, but the nice thing, and we touched on this last month, is that we have two signifiers here. We have shape and color. And so even if your colors are close, you're kind of helped along with um, two different shapes. Um, so I can um, I can zoom out and, and feel like pretty good about the colors I have there. But one thing I could do to sort of unify this whole thing is select maybe some colors over here from my microscopy and have that reflected in my data visualization. And so I would just caution if you want to do something like this, choose some colors over here, just be careful that you're not creating a correlation that you don't intend to. So if a color means something specific, you want to make sure that you're not perpetuating something you don't intend to communicate. But for sake of this demo, let's just see what this looks like. And so I'm going to zoom in really close over here. Um, I'm going to pick a color. Maybe like that, I don't know, one of these pinks. And then I'm going to go over to my swatches palette. Oh, so don't freak out if you see your swatches are these colorblind safe colors. Um, you just need to go over to proof colors and turn that off. So I've made this new swatch. I'm gonna go ahead and make a new, new color group and we'll call it Tammy's colors. And then we'll add this here. And then I, um, I'm gonna do a series of grays and a series of that magenta. So I'm gonna add a black over there. So I have my new color group here. If I double click, and watch what happens over here. I'm going to make this a global color and I'm going to do the same for this black. And making it a global color allows you to use percentages of that uh, color as tints. And it's a, a technique I like to use to minimize the number of colors I have so that something doesn't look like a circus. You know, you can minimize your colors, but you still get 
basically four colors out of one swatch. And a good rule of thumb is that they should be um, at least 20% different. So 20, 40, 60, 80, 100%. Uh, we're gonna be 25, 50, 75, 100, because we have four. But just know that that's a good rule of thumb. So if I go over here and I select, select same fill color, it's gonna select all of those grays in both plots and the legend. And then I'm gonna go to my black and I'm gonna say 25. Um, and then I'm just going to repeat. And you could, of course, use the slider. That's a little painful for me. So I just do, <laughs> I just see the numbers. All right, so I'm going to continue with this, like same fill color. Pick my yeah, why you did why you do that? I was going to mention too that the the other advantage to global num to global colors too is that. Once you establish those and you associate colors with that, um, they they globally control what the uh, what um, each one of those uh, objects that has been applied with that color. So what that means is that you can actually go in and not just change the tint of um, of the swatch itself, but as you change the tint of the swatch and or the the color um, uh, or adjust that color in there then um, it'll make that change, that change globally across your entire uh, document. Yeah, and Alex, could you showed... show us again where the global color thing is? Yeah, mm -hmm. sure. Thanks. I just double clicked. So I didn't make this color group, but it's a gorgeous one. Uh, one thing to know, make sure you don't have something selected over here when you touch any of these swatches or it will recolor something. And if you're me, you won't realize that until like 10 minutes later. Um, Okay, so I just double clicked and then I clicked on global and that's when it's this switched from being the RGB values to being this slider that gave you like all the percentages from zero to 100. Oh wow, that's really cool. Thanks. Cool. Yeah, my pleasure. So if I zoom out now, I like, I like the cohesiveness of the color palette I've got going on here. You know, I've got my grays, I've got the tints of the magenta, like I said, it, um, it adjusted that uh, the colors in the legend. So let's go ahead and check out our preview again. Whoops, just to see how that looks. Oh, so I'm kind of, this is not great. I mean, I can see that this is a different color, but it kind of looks like a bunch of grays. Again, I can tell that there's four different grays, but it's not the best looking um, selection of colors to communicate this data. And these uh, colorblindness checks are not mandatory, but they are a good practice to get into just to see um, how colors will appeal for other appear to other people for um, to be inclusive. But also, it's a good check for your contrast as well. So um, let's go back to our normal setup, and then just like Giovanni said, oh, there's those ugly colors again. Okay, so just like he said, now that this is a swatch that's saved, if I change the swatch here, it's going to update everywhere. And so let's just pretend we want to try something a little like a purple. That still looks nice with the rest of my figure. And if I go up here, I now have a better um, distinction between these two data sets in terms of their color. So um, that is an improvement in terms of readability. So I like it. Go back to RGB. All right, so um, I probably could spend a little more time kind of in here making sure, you know, I can tell that those spaces are not perfect. So I might nudge things around, but overall, um, I feel pretty good about the cohesiveness of the colors in this um, figure, the combination of microscopy and data. Um, another thing I could do is maybe repeat some of these symbols um, up here next to the microscopy, which I actually did for this figure. Um, but I don't want to take too much more time so that Giovanni can have um, his turn to demo a couple of things. Unless, Giovanni, unless you have any thoughts or anything else you want to see here, or if anyone has questions about decisions that were made, I'm happy to um, answer those too. Yeah, no, I the only thing I was, um, I, you and I were talking about this before about how, um, you know, sort of tightening up some space because you just sort of, you know, as you go to export this file, you know, you would normally just, you know, export just the information. You wouldn't necessarily need the rest of the artboard on it. And just as I sort of demonstrate this here, you kind of have this sort of empty zone. Right, the, yeah. um, 
And, and you had, you had sort of mentioned the idea of like creating or carrying those symbols over and labels. Um, and then probably some of that, you know, uh, um, that color story over too. So you could, mm -hmm. um, can, you know, create some continuity because these, uh, these, uh, panels are so um, related. So if all those panels are so tightly related, then the next sort of mental leap is that, well, actually this this key does apply to both situations as well, and that that key could be um, spread across sort of um, the entire bottom. And then that could sort of tighten up and create like less, you know, sort of negative space or white space sitting around um, and a little bit more efficient. But that's about it. Yeah, for sure. Well, I didn't want to go over my um, time, so I'm going to mm -hmm. toss the baton back to you. But I actually, um, I could fiddle around with that and um, and share that, you know, that version on the Slack channel or something like that, if we want to give that a try. Yep. Okay, so I'll uh, go ahead and jump in. I'll pull up my figure that I had sort of pulled together as an example of this. And what I wanted to show was basically a... Another example of um, maybe a little bit more complicated um, data set. So, um, you know, this is something that I don't think would be so uncommon is that you just have multitudes of panels across there. And, you know, it's uh, without sort of reconstructing this, this is a sort of already baked sort of version of it. But I think you can kind of um, through some through a couple of um, quick processes, I'm going to go ahead and through here under the um, selection, I'm going to go ahead and say objects and um, select all text objects. And I'm going to hide those all too. So, um, so that way we can take a look at it. So I'm going to make them go all the way. I think that you can go ahead and do, um, uh, tell myself I'm going to learn these, what these are, but if I hit command three, like option three, if you're on a PC, the, um, then you would get, um, or control three, then you'd um, remove all the um, the text from there, and you can kind of just look at what, what remains as far as the objects. And here you can really kind of appreciate, okay, how everything is really lining up. And another thing that I really like to do is um, add, if I'm going through the trouble of recomposing things and restyling things, then um, it's, you know, with experience, you get quicker at this. And I think um, putting a little extra time for actually creating um, figures that are, that are, created on a consistent module. And what I mean by that is that they're a consistent height as well as width across a series of like um, styled figures or um, uh, graphs. And so why do that? Well, basically, you know, it kind of depends on, on what you're crafting this for, but, um, you know, oftentimes I try to sort of project what uh, future uses might be. Um, and oftentimes uh, you'll find yourself in a situation where you're not just creating this data set for a particular publication, but you're actually thinking, uh, or you, you'll you have to consider the fact that I might apply this to a poster. I might include this in a PowerPoint slide. Um, so baking in that sort of modularity there and the sort of consistency with that means that um, now these things are a lot more flexible. I can... Um, I, I could much more easily animate this in a PowerPoint slide, say, because um, you know the the information can stack directly on top of each other, and then you could sort of animate between those two um, to to be able to show the effects. Um, you can also just sort of stack those elements side by side, and you know all the scale of the uh, of the stroke widths um, of the uh, you know the the size of the, the error bars, the the thickness of you know all the different style decisions, the type size, all of that will be consistent as you apply it to any other kind of scenario. It's not like going to continue to be hodgepodge of things. So um, so that's the same all the way down. Basically, I have the same height, and it's all stacked up, and you can see how these don't these don't fall in perfect columns, but they do fall in um, really consistent um, rows. So um, yeah, let me pull those, pull the text back up and then, um, you know, sort of touching on what um, what uh, Tammy had already said about, you know, um, choosing color that, you know, if you're if you're thinking ahead and at the very beginning of this, um, you're sort of applying the color consistent. That's fab. That's that's great. Um, I certainly don't always remember to do that um, as as long as I've been doing this. So there is a great trick for you to be able to sort of assess the colors and to do that um, all after. And there is a, a, an amazingly powerful tool called the Recolor Artwork Tool. 
Um, and uh, as soon as you make a full selection of all of your all of your objects and you see this color wheel typically pop up. Um, and if you click on this guy, um, there's new features coming out all the time and they've uh, illustrators worked out a couple, um, but uh, currently there's a generative recolor. Uh, I wouldn't, um, that's a, a brand new beta release uh, thing. I wouldn't say, I wouldn't suggest going into that, but uh, I, I, it's worth mentioning because um, when you go to use recolor artwork, some of these features, the alternate features might um, show up there. So it might show up as um, something like this. Um, and you just want to, if, if you want to jump back to those um, the standard window, then just hit advanced options and it'll get you back there. So back in this recolor artwork wheel, what, we, what I can see here is all the colors being used inside this file. And what, I, what it jumps at me right away is I can see that actually colors aren't used consistently. So you might be getting, you know, you might be telling um, a collaborator or somebody else that, you know, I'll, these are the colors that I used and depending on their color space or the, you know, if they, um, if they remember to include the uh, color profile when they were saving the document, color management is a huge thing into itself. So as you're compiling these documents, um, you know, slight subtle differences might be introduced and that might not be, you know, it, it might not be smacking you in the face right away, but um, depending on what is the longevity of that file where it goes next, um, it, those will, um, those can certainly start to drift further and further away. So why don't we just pull all these colors together and make sure they're consistent. And the way that you do this is basically you can come in here and I can grab and select these individual colors and I can um, pull them into a single one. And um, I'm just going to do that with all the like colors that are just slightly off. And um, also, here, this is another nice little feature here is that I can actually um, isolate a color and see um, where it's being affected. So um, I, if I click on this uh, sort of magenta color, then I can see it happening in these spaces. And then I can click on this other one and oh, immediately I see where my outliers are. Um, so that's a good thing too, if, you're, um, if you can't figure out where the heck that, that sort of errant color is um, happening, you can kind of spotlight it that way. Um, so I'm gonna finish combining all those things. And then I'm gonna select under this dropdown, um, exact. And I'm going to make sure that that's applying to all the instances here rather than just this one color band. And then so when I click out of that, then um, I can also, I'll just check in on these and I'm making sure that um, there's a single color appearing on here. If there's more than one color, then I can see it happening here. And then um, I can go ahead and say, okay. And um, if I go back into that recolor artwork panel there, then I'm going to see just those single colors and it's a beautifully consistent. And um, so it's not just good for making sure that they're consistent, but it's also good for altering them. So I'll, um, I'll check back on this in just a second, but first I'm gonna go back to this really good tool that um, Tammy already showed that is gonna say, um, let's uh, proof the colors and let's see. Oh, I don't have it set up for my colorblindness check. So I'm gonna do the colorblindness check as well. So it's um, sort of good practice. Um, and what I'm seeing here is that actually there's not a whole lot of difference that's happening across these um, two colors that look quite different um, than I had it just a moment ago. So if I had, um, uh, sorry, hold on a second. My tablet is freaking out. I'm just gonna disconnect it, which might cause a quick little refresh. And we talked about developing some colorblind safe color palettes that we we that did we can, yeah that we can develop for Gladstone and then we could share those um, when when we can do it and that will be helpful too. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a uh, um, it's uh, a definitely something that um, you know as I mean the the. The color safe palette for colorblind, and there are many, many different types of colorblind, but um, Illustrator Photoshop, they offer this check on the two primary different versions, but I think covers the vast majority of, um, of the population that really is affected by colorblindness, but it really does sort of, um, it's a very narrow gamut of colors to choose from. And yeah, so you're, so it's not a lot of sort of wiggle room, but, but right here, you can kind of see, it's, and it's hard to know when you don't, when you don't see in that color palette. Um, but uh, if I click out of here, 
Um, then I come back and I'm like, wow, that's, you know, that it looks like a significant difference to me. Clearly it's not. Um, if, if I go back in here to my recolor palette, then I can go in and select this. And what I do know is that um, colors like cyan and magenta um, um, do actually show up um, quite a bit. And so that's something that I just um, sort of keep in mind. So if I'm going to, um, if I push this a little bit more towards the cyan and uh, end of the spectrum, or excuse me, magenta on this one. And if I go to this one and I'm going to push it more towards the cyan end of the spectrum. Um, then I'm seeing um, I'm seeing a similar amount of distinction, but what I'm hoping to see once I switch it over is that um, oops, you proof colors that um, that I'll see a little bit more distinction. Oh, and this is um, so this isn't fantastic. I think I could probably do better there. But you can see how you can do sort of a back and forth and um, and sort of start to adjust your colors. So that way uh, you can kind of hone in on something that's going to meet uh, a wider need. And I'll just add contrast. to this. Sometimes it is really about the contrast. So even if yeah. you're, you know, like even if your colors um, aren't showing up when you do one of these tests, um, if there's enough contrast between them, sometimes that's really enough, you know. So that yeah. sometimes I will think about making sure I have lighter tones and, and darker um, tones in a figure, as long as that light and darkness isn't communicating like intensity or dilution or anything like that. That's another yeah. way to go, because then you, you're sure that those will have enough contrast to be visible. Yeah, absolutely. And I can even go in here and I um, uh, that, you know, once I'm in that preview mode, then I can go into this recolor artwork tool. And while I'm seeing that preview, I can do that live and I can kind of adjust those two as, as less of a guessing game. Um, and then you can see truly what's happening over here. The over here is where the adjustments are happening. Here's where I started and here's where I'm ending up. So I'm going to go ahead and make that change and then turn off that pre uh, preview color mode. And there I am back to it. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's not the most uh, appealing color palette per se, but um, but yeah, you can keep playing with that. And as Tim said, I think um, I think the conversation is going to continue, and we're going to um, look to providing more resources about and how you can actually um, plug those kind of palettes in. And I do not use that recolor artwork, but now I want to because yeah, I mean, yeah, this is super it's, cool. Yeah, it is. And I, I only showed you half of that. Um, there's another component to this where you can actually shift the colors um, globally and um, in different ways and apply different color books, which uh, we can dive into more um, another instance or another episode of this. One other thing I did want to show um, that I think is pretty rad um, because, you know, that half the name of the game in, um, in Illustrator really is figuring out how to select and isolate objects that you really want. Um, you know, I showed you how to, how I just selected all the text objects. Um, so, you know, that's a good way of um, basically isolating those objects. So that way you can work exclusively with those. So I just selected all of those text objects again, and um, I kind of want to just bring all of those to not to a separate layer, but to a separate grouping. Um, so that way mm -hmm. I can, I can kind of group work with those in an isolated way. Um, so if I go to try to group that, I can hit command G, um, it's not going to let me because it's in, they're in separate layers and this has been organized already in one way. So the way you get around that is actually you cut. So I'm going to hit command X and I'm going to cut all of those objects. Don't, don't worry about it. I'm going to paste and I'm going to paste. Um, I always use command F, which is paste in front. Me too. Um, Cause that, that always will place it directly in place of where you cut it from rather than back to the center of the artboard. If you hit command V. So they're gonna they're gonna retain all of their placements, and then now that I pasted it, you can see that they're all sitting up here at the top of this layer, and um, outside of whatever kind of structure that they were in before. And now, if I command G to group all those, boom, I get them all, and that they're all grouped together. And now, I'm, now that they're all grouped, now what I can do is I can um, I can uh, context click on this, and I can say isolate this selected group. Um, and so when I do that, then you can see all the other content is grayed out. And basically the only thing I can select is all of those typed objects. 
Um, so uh, the next layer of this, and this is when you really, if you haven't been going through this and applying, say, color or styles to that kind of consistently, um, what you can kind of do is quickly kind of go through and try to select all like styled things. Um, you know, say if I didn't want, um, say if I wanted to convert all of these panel labels um, rather than lowercase, I want to put them all in uppercase. And at this point, I can go in here and say under select, go under same. And then under these, you have all these new, and these are new, relatively new features mm -hmm. um, for selection. But I can say font family, font styles, styles and size. So let's try that out. So immediately I've selected now all the panel labels here. You can see that as I kind of pull it off to the side. Um, and um, if I'm going to go in here, oh, I can't see because of zoom, move out of my way, zoom. And at this point now I can convert this over to all caps and there I don't have to select anything individually, but I can grab those all too. And you can do the same thing for, you know, um, uh, you know, changing, changing the general style of things, um, you know, as you want to tweak the hierarchy of the page, I want some things bolder. I want some things larger. I want to make sure that, you know, all my, um, the tick marks are consistent. Um, so that's one way you can kind of, uh, quickly flex and um, jump into those very targeted aspects of it. And I think that's all I had. Do we have anything else um, that we wanted specifically to cover? I'm trying to think now. Ah, I did. So uh, another, we're talking about a lot of this university, the sort of global changes that we're making to, um, uh, to our, our document and I'm trying to look at my zoom controls. I can't see anybody. I got lost them when I had to, my screen refreshed. You can see me though, right, Tammy? Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, okay. I won't worry about that. Um, so the other thing I wanted to show you was that basically, um, uh, we've we've taken a lot of care to make all that color consistent on this one panel or this one, excuse me, this one entire figure and across all these panels. And then I maybe even also um, made sure that there was a uh, consistency with, um, you know, typographic styling. Well, um, you know, there's um, there there's something to be said for making sure that those consistencies are brought across all of the figures in an entire figure set. And um, you know, a feature that I don't think um, is utilized enough is the multiple artboards capability on an mm -hmm. Illustrator. So I can literally, you know, I've, I've worked up this one. It's a pretty good standard. It's actually, it's not specified to, any, to a specific journal. It's only on an eight and a half by 11 letter. Um, but I can, um, you know, replicate this, this artboard across and, um, and, you know, obviously, I'd, if I were to start a new figure, I'd be deleting this content and starting over again. But um, but I can actually go with an eyedropper tool and I can start um, selecting those exact same colors. Or as you did, Tammy, I can um, make sure that I'm using the same swatch palette, uh, you know, and the, those global swatches across all of those. And again, sort of managing all of these sort of globally across multiple figures. So it doesn't just necessarily apply to one. And you can export all your artboards as pages in a PDF too. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Managing all of that is just, in my opinion, is just so much more easy when you have them all in a single document. The one thing you do have to worry about though, is that as, as these figures are very complicated or get more and more complicated, depending on what your data sets are. I mean, I've definitely worked with data sets that are in the hundreds of thousands of points. Um, and you know, Illustrator will start to bog down at some point. So you really have to figure out what your limit is or how you're actually including that data. If you can ever keep it, you know, those, you know, say that the, you know, a single panel had hundreds of thousands of data points on it. Are you going to keep those as vector or could you actually rasterize those elements at a high enough resolution that it's not going to affect anything um, or the quality of it, but it won't be uh, vector points that need to be um, uh, redrawn as they say, uh, each mm -hmm. time. Yeah. You know, another, if you do start to see things bogged down, then, um, then you could just go into outline mode 
which is uh, a lot less um, uh, of a heavy sort of file to process for Illustrator too. So that's also another kind of trick here. If something's starting to bog down and you know it's different, the redraw is taking a lot of time. Yeah. Anything else, Tammy? No, I think that's it. I think we're, we're hoping that someone might have brought one of their questions or. We did have well, that one question. We yeah. did have that one question about um, loading PowerPoint or loading PDFs into PowerPoint, yeah. which we could go over. Should I go ahead and pull that up? Sure. I mean, unless anyone, unless anyone here brought something they wanted to talk about or were having trouble with. Or Otherwise, any, I do, I do any think that's a good follow up questions. One. Yeah. 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 Are there any questions about anything we showed or did anyone bring anything that they were having trouble with that we could workshop. That is a no. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do think this PDF PowerPoint thing is a good one, and it, it is one that came up between last session and this session. And I imagine something that, you know, will come up again for people. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so the question I, I well, think I was. was, I was just Oh. Sorry, I was just going to say, I don't have a question, but I've been using uh, Adobe, um, sorry, Illustrator for a while now, but you guys mm -hmm. taught me like uh, so many new things. So I'm just really thankful that you guys did this workshop because, yes, yeah, some of that, like you said, like global management, once you exported all of your like figures you've made from like GraphPad or something to uh, Illustrator, I literally was going back to GraphPad and like changing the colors by each individual graph. So to know that I could have done that in Illustrator would have made things much uh, quicker. So thank you for doing this. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think we have, we've had a lot of discussions, Tammy and I have about like um, actually trying to help out. Um, you know, I think we both recognize that a lot of, a lot of times when you're exporting from those, uh, those graphing applications that you can obviously set a lot of the settings um, of, of the style choices directly in that application. And so there's, there's multitudes of those applications and obviously they're all, have their own um, style settings in them. So sort of chasing that down and, and Tammy and I, we don't work on those applications, right? We only get what's exported from them. So mm -hmm. we have no expertise in them really. I think you've, you've worked a little bit on Cytoscape and I think I've, Love I have the free version of Prism or stuff like that. I think I've opened up twice. Uh, so, but I think that's an opportunity that we really could um, help define some of those preset styles for you all when you're um, when you're doing that, so that way you start out from sort of a common ground each time, um, and then and then that'll make that restyling in Illustrator, I think, uh, a little more simplified. Yeah, but Illustrator is that's that's the great thing about Illustrator. It is the um, it's that application that can really uh, alter everything about it. As long as the information is vector, you can. You can change it and then with uh with a great deal of subtlety and it's not going anywhere like it's going to be the standard you know oh yeah yeah forever um yeah that's that's and it's also in development constantly so it's um yeah it being sort of so ubiquitous and um the standard across things um so um thanks for that uh so um, yeah, the question that we had about PowerPoint, and I think this is a really good one and um, why we want to cover it is that basically there is a weird bug in PowerPoint where um, when you're importing, um, when you're importing figures into there uh, and specifically PDFs, um, that depending on the PDF, um, once you sort of um, once you place that file into the PowerPoint and you close out of that session, um, you may come back to that later and open it up. And now all of a sudden that PDF um, or that that PDF that you place looks like garbage in that in that PowerPoint. Um, do you remember who brought us that that question, Tammy? Yeah, it was. Um, it was uh, Murad in the Marson lab, I think. Oh, right. Yeah. So he had done this beautiful presentation and all of his figures looked crisp and gorgeous. And 
So that was great. But then he closed it. And then when he opened it a couple weeks later to make an adjustment or do something, about half of them were very pixelated and distorted and stretched. Um, and he didn't know why. And he said he had imported all of them as PDFs because he thought a PDF that would be crisp, right? It, it retains some of that vector information. So he thought that was the right way to go. And honestly, I've done that before too. I've imported PDFs before, but he couldn't figure out why some of them were getting, you know, garbageified and some were not. It was, and it was a, it was a real mystery. I didn't yeah. actually have a good answer, which is why, you know, we had that chat about it. Yeah. And I'm, I'm going to try to um, set this up in a way that, um, uh, that I can sort of demonstrate this. So I've got, I've got a couple of um, like relatively complicated sort of um, graphics going on here that I, um, and like I said, I think there's, I've done a little research on this. I've certainly experienced it myself and found a workaround on it, but um, what is actually going on in here isn't really clear to the user base and, um, and Microsoft isn't being really forthright about it either. Apparently since like 2020, I think in the mid teens, this sort of started popping, popping up as far as I can gather, but um, I'll, I'll demonstrate the phenomenon real quick um, where if we're going to place some content and I'm going to have to go back into uh, where did I put this thing? I actually organized it so that way I could do this. Okay, so um, I'm gonna just drag and drop this um, this PDF in here as you should be able to do. And that should be no different than really placing a file. And I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna um, scale this guy up and um, get it because I only want this sort of section. Um, but uh, what I what you should see at this point is that like, okay, well, if I place this file, then it should be good. Um, if I go ahead and save this file and I'll, um, I'll do that now, let's see, and I'm just going to save it here to my demo folder. And, um, now if I go back to open that up, uh, let's see, I'll close it first. How about we do that? And I will open this back up. And we'll see if it doesn't. Did that not work? Okay, thank you. So I opened this back up, and now you can see here that this is completely pixelated. Um, so uh, why did that happen? Like I said, no one really can confirm why. Um, but it, it, what is known is that basically PowerPoint's making the determination of whether it's going to save this as not, it doesn't save things as P, PDFs innately, but it will save it as a, what's called an EMF file, which carries vector data, or it'll convert it to a JPEG. And for some reason, and, pro, and probably likely due to either the transparency and or the complexity, the sheer the number of points that are in the, in the uh, vector file, that it's making that determination and deciding to dump it as a JPEG. And in the process of that, it's not um, it's not doing it to the resolution that you wanted or you placed it as. Um, it's 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 definitely compressing that more and or um, making it smaller. So the workaround for this as a process is basically if I if if you're working in Illustrator and grabbing vector information, um, or even if you were working um, in that PowerPoint, let's just do an apples and apples comparison and say yeah, let's drop in that that um, that PDF as I did before. So I'm just gonna grab my grab my file here. Let's see where was it? Here was my little copy of that. I'm gonna place it again. I'm gonna scale this again because I'm really after these two panels and I wanna include those in my presentation. So I wanna scale them up to the size that I want. And the handy little workaround here is that I get to import my PDF. Um, that I wanted to as a PDF. So that way I don't have to go in and make a screenshot or make anything like that. I get the nice, beautiful vector graphics. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna convert that directly here in um, PowerPoint to the file, to the format that I want. And so um, I'm gonna go ahead, now that I've got it to the scale that I want, um, and that's important because that's gonna determine the resolution of it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna hit Command X. I'm gonna cut that object out. And um, this is um, this is the only kind of tricky bit is that I'm going to paste this right back in. 
Um, but this time I'm not going to just do a command V. I'm going to do a, a paste special. And when I hit that paste special, I'm giving I'm given um, particular options. PDF is still one of them. Um, Microsoft graphic object, that's another one. Uh, I don't really trust those things because it comes from Microsoft, I'm a Mac person. But this, uh, the other two things are PNG and TIFF. Um, what's good about these both of these options is that they both carry transparency, which is nice because um, then I can kind of overlay those things. I don't have to worry about a white box being about something. Um, so I'm gonna, I like both of those options. PNG is um, is going to be a smaller format, though. I know that because it is a compression format, although it's classified as a lossless format. So it's not going to be as high a compression and also kind of destroying pixels um, the same way, say, a JPEG would be. So um, I think PNG is a great option. So I'm going to select that, and it will paste back in this object. Um, and it's not as big as it was before, right? But actually, that's a little bit um, deceiving. If I double-click on this, then I should get my format pane. And I go look at the size here, twirl this down, and I can see it's only at 47%. So in fact, I do have this at full size. If I say 100% in here, then I can, I get it back to the full size that I wanted it. And now I can go in here and use my crop tool and I can just isolate the element that I really, really want. I'm gonna zoom out a tiny bit here so that way I can grab my crop, get in here and just crop to these guys. All right. And say, um, you know, say I don't want those panel labels on there because they don't mean anything to me anymore. Um, then I can crop to here and a nice little trick. And I'll just I would just do each one, uh, you know, sort of duplicate these and do each one individually. But at this point, I can kind of come in here and I can not just use a regular crop, but I could probably use a rounded edge crop. And if I use that rounded edge crop, then I can isolate out that um, that panel label. It's sort of not showing up here, but you can see how I can pull this in and it's giving me that rounded corner. I promise it's there. It's not really showing up, but it's there. <laughs> so uh, so at this point, I've got it completely isolated. I've got it transparent. It's beautiful resolution. And then the last step is if I'm happy with this and I'm ready to sort of confirm that. Um, I guess I'm not because I, I did want to do that to its neighbor. And I can go back into this crop and pull that neighbor over. So now I got both of those. Let's make sure I got all that. Yeah, looks pretty good. I'm over a little bit more. All right. So now I got both of those guys. I can select them both. And now let's just bake them in and call it good. And I do that by um, going up here. I'm not getting a full menu. There we go. Compress picture. Now that will, um, I'm only doing it to the selected pictures right here, um, but I'm just gonna basically uh, remove all that other information that I don't want anymore. And I'm gonna isolate it to these, uh, to specifically to these objects that I want to really make that sort of uh, more efficient file size. I'm gonna hit okay. And now this, these are two targeted and um, isolated images ready for use in your PowerPoint file. And those are technically PNGs now, right? They are PNGs, yeah. So they're no longer vector, but the you, but we sort of took advantage of that vector placement to get all the resolution that you would have uh, been able to appreciate in a PowerPoint slide, right? Because these are, you know, as big or bigger than you may actually need. Because if you're going to get that title in there, then you're always going to be reducing. Reducing is always better than trying to enlarge. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's that. That's that workaround. I was going to say we have one minute left, but I love this because this mm -hmm. is a good segue into our where our next session is going to be about PowerPoint. So it was kind of the perfect question to um, end this session with, and then know that we'll talk more about PowerPoint yeah. next time. Do you want to do you want to tee that one up and say what we are going to be covering? I mean, you <laughs> I just sort of did, but <laughs> you'd have to look it up. Yeah, I'd yeah. have to look it up. Yes, PowerPoint. Okay. Well, uh, stay tuned because next time is going to be amazing. <laughs> and we're going to dive into PowerPoint. And uh, I think it's all of our favorite application. By the way, a uh, nice little Easter egg that we found in PowerPoint this week um, where there was a show your pride um, mm. uh, 
toggle in PowerPoint where the icon for PowerPoint <laughs> changed to a rainbow. I don't know if anybody else knows about this. I certainly do. We randomly came across it, but. And that slider um, yeah. did too, right? The, the yeah, area yeah. on that slider was rainbow too. Yeah, yeah, funny little Easter egg in, in Microsoft. Go Microsoft. We'll okay, it. well, yeah, exactly. Any, any final right. questions or comments or anything? Well, if you say? do, pop it in the Slack channel, <laughs> now available on Slack, certainly. Yeah, we're at time. I think we're gonna kill it here. All right, but, um, hope to see you next Thanks month. so much. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Bye-bye, y'all.